Chapter 10, part three. So let's take a look at this example. We have a helicopter blade here. So a blade has an angular speed of 6.5 revolutions per second. So it rotates 6.5 times per second, okay? And an angular acceleration of 1.3 revolution per second square. So right now I know that angular speed or omega is 6.5 revolution per second and um, angular acceleration of alpha of 1.3 revolution per second square for point one which is right there so it's somewhere in the middle find the magnitude of a the tangential speed so we're looking for the magnitude of v okay and the tangential acceleration. So A sub T, looking for these two. All right, so this point, point one, has a length or has an R, which is three meters. So I know that point one or R1 is three meters. I know that, and point two, which is at the end right there, is 6.7 meters away. So the R for that, for R2, is 6.7 meters. So I'm just simply writing down things that the figure is telling me. I know V is R omega, okay? So if I'm looking for point one, V1 is R omega one, or omega. So R is three, meters, omega is 6.5 revolutions per second. So 6.5 revolution per second. Now we shouldn't stop here because uh, we have to change this revolution, all right? So what I have is V1 is three times, um, V1 is, three times 6.5 revolution per second in the way that one revolution is two pi radian, okay? So now this revolution, this revolution will cancel out. I have radian here, which is uh, dimensionless, okay? And simply it's just two pi. And then I have second on the denominator and the three is meters. So overall, whatever the number is, this will be in meters per second because this guy is in meters. So V1 would be three times 6.5 times two pi. And then whatever it is, this will be in meters per second. Okay, so this is your tangential velocity. Okay, for acceleration, we know that it is R times alpha. Okay, R times alpha, and alpha has been given to us, 1.3. So R is three meters, 1.3 revolution per second, in the way that one revolution is two pi radian. One revolution is two pi radian. So what I have here is that this radian denominator and this radian will cancel out. Then I will end up with A sub T being three times 1.3, is that 1.3? Yes, times two pi, and it will be meters per second square. And this is a square, by the way, revolution per second a square. So this would be your tangential acceleration at the end. So take a look at another example. Starting from rest, the thrower accelerate uh, the discus to a final angular speed, angular speed of 15 radian per second. So I know omega is plus 15 
radian per second. It's going counterclockwise, so that's why it's positive. And in, in a time of 0.27 seconds, so I know the time lapse of that is 0.27 seconds. I know that as well. Before releasing it during the acceleration, the discus moves in a circular arc of radius 0.81. In other words, the length of the arm of this guy is about 0.8 meters. So uh, R is 0.81 meters. Again, I, am, I don't care about the significant figure here. All I care about is how we solve a problem, okay? So, uh, what we're looking for, find the magnitude of the total acceleration. In other words, we are looking for this A, which is a, a, um, overall the sum of tangential and central pedal um, acceleration. So we have to consider both, okay? Now, Let's first find the A sub CP, or towards the center uh, of the circular motion, which is V squared over R, or R squared omega squared over R, which I can easily write it as R omega squared. Okay, so I have R, which is 0.8, and I have omega, which is 15, and I can make it to the power of 2, okay? So um, then whatever this is, this will be the unit of meters per second a square, okay? Now, so that's the value for it, whatever it is. You can just put it in your calculator to find the value for it. So it's just a matter of letting our calculators to calculate that. Now, if I want to find the a tangential so a tangential is r alpha which is r alpha is delta omega over delta t okay r is delta omega over delta t which i can write it as omega minus omega zero t minus t zero okay now if you're looking at this it started from zero okay starting from rest so starting from rest means omega zero is zero so these two quantities they are both zero we start from zero from the speed of zero right so i have omega over t and a tangential is r which is 0.81 omega which is 15, T is 0.27. Okay, now if that's the case, I have find a value for tangential ex acceleration and it will be in meters per second as well, per second square, this is per second square as well. Now they are both perpendicular to one another. In other words, I have tangential, tangent to the path, and I have centripetal always towards the center. So if I want to show it in a, um, inside a actual circle, I would, I would be able to show it maybe right here. So what I have is this, that that's my point. This is the A towards the center of centripetal acceleration, and this is A sub T, which is the tangential acceleration. They are always making a right angle, okay? So this angle is always 90 degrees. In other words, if you want to find the total value, then you have to have A CP squared plus A tangent squared, okay? And then this would be the value for overall acceleration okay now let's consider this case that we have a rolling motion if a if a round object rolls without a slipping this is this is very impor important it does not a slip 
there is a fixed relationship between the relation, uh, translational and rotational speed. So translational is that you have an object transiting from this point, point one, all the way to point two, okay? Using velocity of V. But it's not only transiting, it's also rotating at the same time. We have a rotational speed. And as I said before, this is the relation. I have proved, proved this in the first two videos part one and part two of this chapter. So go ahead and watch that if you, if, uh, if you don't remember it. So V was omega cross R, or if you want to find, and these are vector quantities, by the way. And if you want to find the value for it or the magnitude of the velocity, V is just simply omega R or R, cross, R times omega, just multiply them. Okay, so this is something that we have done in the previous video, in the previous examples. Or you can write it like this. Either way, I have proved those um, in, this, um, in this two previous examples, okay? Now, if, if, if this well is going from point one to point two, but it is going to the displacement of exactly equal to the circumference of the circle, so this displacement from x2 minus x1 is exactly the area around the well, which is 2 pi r. Okay, then the velocity, which is just delta x over delta t, is x2 minus x1 and t2 minus t1. The delta x or the displacement is exactly 2 pi r. Okay, 2 pi r. And then delta t is the time that it took to do one complete rotation or the circumference of the um, will, which is one complete rotation. So the time will be the period or the, the capital T. Okay, so V is two pi over T times R. And we know what this two pi over T is. We have seen this before, that's omega. I have, I have shown that what, how this is equals to omega in the previous video. So go ahead and watch it, okay? Now, this is V being equal to omega times R, the value for it. If you want to find the direction, cross product of the two vectors, okay? So this is the relationship between the angular x the velocity okay and tangential speed with r so this is the relationship of the speed or tangential velocity and angular velocity that you can see here i just highlighted it okay so uh, remember that we had a rolling wheel that was rolling and it was moving at the same time. So we, we, can, can, we can do something. We can consider rolling motion to be a combination of a pure rotational and pure translational motion, okay? And in our previous case, you had a wheel rolling from point one all the way to point two, okay? It's, it has a transitional velocity going from point one all the way to point two. There's an object, that's going from point one all the way to point two with a velocity of V. But this object at the same time moving and moving around a circle around itself. So I can consider this as a combination of two pure different motions. One is uh, we have a, take a look at B first. So B is an object moving a solid object without rotating, moving to the right. So all the points, almost all the points in this object, they are all moving with the same speed. So everything is moving with V equals R omega, okay? If I combine that with a purely rotational motion, okay, with a purely rotational motion, then all of these points around the circle with a constant r would have the same velocity of r omega as well. 
okay? But it's not the same for this point because the, this point would have a different R, R prime, for example, okay? The center, would have a different R and the R, that R is zero. So the center, at the center, I'm just gonna use it right here to say it, at center, R is zero. So in other words, the center has no um, tangential velocity, okay? Or V that you can see here. So you, if you combine these two, you have a center that is moving with only along one line, it does not rotate at all, okay? Going from point one to point two, this center point is just moving from this point all the way to the next point, which is right there, for example. This point has two types of velocity. The first type is this, which is going to the right, and the second type is this, which is all the way going to the left, and they are equal, so this will, this will cancel at this point. And at that point, all the way to the top, I have two of the same velocities, both in the same direction. V equals R omega all the way to the right. V equals R omega all the way to the right for these two different types. So in other words, if I combine them, I'll get two times R times omega for velocity. Okay? Or in other words, you can think of this motion to be purely along an axis like this. So I can think of this um, circle to do a circular motion around this point, okay? So we have an R here. So this point would have the velocity of R omega, but then this point would have a 2R from the axis of rotation. So in other words, its velocity would be its R, which is 2R times omega. So I can think of a rolling wheel as, a, as if it is at each point at each point of time, as at each second, doing a purely rotational motion at this axis, at this point, at the point of contact with the ground, okay? As if you have this circle, but this circle itself is moving in a circular motion around this point. So at the center, the distance is R, so you have R omega for velocity. But at this point, you have 2R as a distance, so 2R omega would be the velocity, okay? Kind of like, uh, if, I can, if I can illustrate that, if I can show what I mean using some methods that I know, so let's see if I can do that. So kind of moving around a circle, right? But the axis of rotation in our case is here. Okay, so once it is moving, it will move like this. So it'll be here at that point. In other words, this full circle is going around this point, the point of contact, okay? I can think of a motion of a wheel going straight forward, rotating and also transiting from point one to point two as an instantaneous rotation around, purely rotation around the axis of uh, around the point of contact with ground. I can do that. Okay. Rotational kinetic energy and the moment of inertia. 
Now, it, we, what is the kinetic energy one more time? The kinetic energy that we know from previous chapters were K equals half MV squared. Okay, that's what the K is. Um, and how do you know that something has a kinetic energy? Because the object is moving. It has some velocity associated with it. Okay, so I have a velocity here and know that the velocity is not zero. So I say that the kinetic energy is not zero. Okay, now if an object is rotating, just purely rotation, okay, because the object is moving and there is some sort of a velocity associated with this object, we know that the angular velocity is not zero, okay, then the uh, the kinetic energy of rotation is not zero then because the object, even though it doesn't do any translational, but it's rotating around a circle, okay? It's doing some rotation, rotational motion. So the velocity, the kinetic energy should not be zero. So if I want to write it like this, I would say, I start with the old formula that I know, half mv squared. And I know this what m uh, this v is, okay? I know the v the value for v is r omega squared. I can write it as half m r omega uh, r squared omega squared, okay? Simply r to the power of two omega to the power of two, and then I can write k being half. Now this is called moment of inertia. Okay, which is called I in physics, I omega squared, all right? So if you're comparing these two formulas, half, half, M, I, V squared, omega squared, okay? So this is rotational kinetic energy, okay? So this is rotational kinetic energy. That's what it is. And it's very easy because you can just say that instead of M, I have I, instead of velocity, translational tangent velocity, I have omega, which is angular velocity because the object is rotating, okay? Now, it is important to know that I, which is the moment of inertia, is m r squared here, right? It does not only depend on mass of the object, but it's also depend on r, the distance of the object from the axis of rotation, okay? This is the distance from the axis of rotation. Object from axis of rotation, okay? So in other words, it is important to know the configuration of the system, okay? Not only the masses are important, but also how far they are from the axis of rotation are also important, right? So the moment of inertia of a set of particles, then that would be the moment of inertia from particle one, and the moment of inertia from particle two plus moment of inertia of particle three and so on and so forth, you add them up, you get the total moment of inertia or sigma of mi ri to the power of two, i goes from um, one all the way to n, n particles, let's say, okay? And the rotational kinetic energy of the rigid body Okay, rigid body. Having the moment of inertia of I is, as I said, half I omega squared, okay? And we have, we, have it, we have it here, how, I mean, this is the exact same thing that I showed here, right here, this is the exact same thing. Okay, so if I, if I want to uh, find the total kinetic energy, rotational kinetic energy of the system, I have to add all the little kinetic energies. In other words, the total kinetic energy would be the kinetic energy 
rotational kinetic energy of particle one plus rotational kinetic energy of particle two plus rotational kinetic energy of particle three and so on. So I would say that the sum of kinetic energy of all the particles, I going from one all the way to n, if we had n particles, okay? So I can write it like this, sigma of i half m r i squared m i omega i squared, okay? That's what the formula is being equal to half as half, omega, they're probably all rotating with the same angular velocity. So I have half omega, and then this stigma is m i r i squared omega omega squared. Okay, now what this guy is, I know what this guy is. This is the total of moment of inertia of all the objects or for my system. So in other words, kinetic energy uh, total would be half I total, total moment of inertia of the system times omega squared. Okay. Now let's take a look at this example. Uh, we want to double the radius of the uh, rotating solid sphere. So I have a solid sphere rotating while keeping its energy, uh, kinetic energy constant. So this is rotational kinetic energy. Rotational kinetic energy is uh, half I omega squared, okay? We want to keep the same kinetic energy. So kinetic energy of one should be equal to the kinetic energy of two of the second type. And, uh, but we want to double the ra radius. So if you double the radius, that means that you are kind of dealing with another moment of inertia because remember the moment of inertia was mr squared so double the radius you will have another moment of inertia so i1 and i2 but we want to keep this to be the same the kinetic energy of one and kinetic energy of two would be the same so we want to double the radius of a rotating solid sphere while keeping its kinetic energy constant the mass does not change of course to do this, the final angular velocity of the sphere must be, so if you do that, so this is omega 1, omega 2. So you have half I1 omega 1 squared equal half I2 omega 2 squared, okay? Half I1 is M R1 squared omega 1 squared is half m r2 squared omega 2 squared okay r1 is r1 omega 1 is omega 1 r2 is doubled so I have two R1 instead of R2, okay, squared, omega two squared. So I have R1 is squared, omega one is squared, two to the power of two is four, four R1 is squared, omega two squared, okay. So this R1 is squared and R1 is squared will cancel out. And then I'll have one over four, omega one is squared being omega two is squared. In other words, 1 over 2 omega 1 squared should be omega 2 squared. Put them under the square root. You have 1 over 2 omega 1 being omega 2. So omega 2 is half of the omega 1, half of its initial value. 
So these are some of the moment of inertias of some uh, very common bodies that we usually encounter in physics problems. So we have a cylinder here uh, or a rod and the axis of rotation is right there at the center and the length is L. So the moment of inertia is one over 12 ML squared. If the axis of a rotation of the same rod is right here at the end, so you have a solid rod rotating like this, then it is one over three M L squared. If you have a rectangle plate, one side is A, the other side is B, then you have one over 12 M A squared plus B squared. And so on and so forth. So you have it, for example, for um, a solid sphere or for a hollow sphere or, you know, uh, for, uh, you know, uh, for example, cylinder um, and hollow cylinder. So depending on the mass and the configuration uh, of these particles, the um, moment of inertia based on the configuration of these particles and the shape of this and where the axis of rotation is would be different. For example, here the axis of rotation is at the center, but here is at one of the ends. So depend. So you can see that the moment of inertia are completely different. Now, the, if you want to find the moment of inertia, if you have, let's say that this is the axis of rotation, okay? So this is my axis of rotation. And this is the body, this, that solid particle, okay? So I have R right here, all right? And the moment of inertia is M, which is the mass of this object, times R squared, if you have one particle. For a configuration of particles, all very close together, like a sphere or a hollow cylinder or you know, a rod, that they make a solid body and they are not just particles, you, do, you have to do the integration. So I is the integral of M uh, R squared dr, okay? And the R would be different, for example, from point A all the way to point B, and, uh, or point zero from the center all the way to point R. And if you do that, then you will find what the uh, moment of inertia for the, each solid object is. But this will not work for some of these objects. The other uh, very useful example that we have, that um, formula that we have that I know that it works, is this that I have. Moment of inertia. So this is for only one particle do, going in a circular motion, okay? Um, around a circle. But if you want to find it for a, a solid body, then your I is the integral of R squared dm. So this integral will be more focused on the uh, mass of uh, each particle in the configuration of all the particles all closely together from zero all the way to m, okay? And then you can write this dm based on the density. So I know rho is, for example, for a uh, sphere is its mass divided by its uh, volume, v. So in other words, you have the mass over 4 pi r squared over 3, r cubed over 3. So 4 over 3 p r cubed. So this will be your rho or the density. A lot of times we give you the density. So I can use this density to find the mass, rho four over three pi r cubed. And then I can find dm, then I can find dm, all right? And I can use that dm right here, all right? for a sphere, for a sphere like this. But I'm not gonna test you on that because this could get extremely difficult. So let's take a look at this example, example number seven. 
So in this problem, we have a, a thin walled hollow cylinder of mass M of H and radius R of H and the solid cylinder mass M of S and radius R of S starting from rest at the top of the an incline right there. And determine which cylinder has the greatest translational speed upon reaching to the bottom. Okay, if that's the case, they both start from the, the zero, uh, they start from H zero. So they start from the same height. So the initial energy would be the same, okay? So the initial potential energy, because they start from rest, so they do not have any type of uh, kinetic energy. So MGH zero would be their initial value for uh, potential energy and overall the, their overall energy at that point. Now, kinetic energy, when they get to the bottom, will have the same type of value, okay? So kinetic energy is half m v squared plus half i omega squared. Why is that? Because it's not only rotating, it's not only transiting from point all the way from top to the bottom, but it's also rotating. So it has both type of energies, okay? So it has both rotational kinetic energy and translational kinetic energy. It has both of them, okay? So if I do that, then I'll have K being equal to half mv squared plus half i for the, uh, let's say, hollow cylinder. It's given hollow cylinder i is mr squared. So I can write it as m r squared omega squared, okay? K is half m v squared plus half m r squared omega squared. And this r squared omega squared, so what I'm gonna do is to kind of identify that r squared omega squared, we know what this is. This is v squared. v was r omega, so this is v squared, all right? So in other words, what you have is half mv squared plus half mv squared. So you have mv squared being your kinetic energy for the halosphere. So um, u being equal to mgh, it is equal to k and it is equal to mv squared. So mgh is mv squared. This m and this M will cancel out for the hollow cylinder. In other words, your V is square root of GH. And in order to identify and to make it a little bit more clear for you, when you if you're if you're only looking at the PDF, this is for the hollow cylinder. So I'm just going to put an H here to make it, you know, unique. So you know that this is not a solid cylinder, all right? They will cancel out. Now let's do the same thing for solid cylinder, all right? So what I have here is a solid cylinder moving down. So I have U being equal to K and the K is K of the transitional plus K of the rotational. Okay, so K is half M V squared plus half I omega squared. Now let's take a look at and see what the K is for a solid body. It's half M R squared, so So this guy 
is half m r squared. So I have k being half m v squared plus half half m r squared omega squared. Now I know what this r squared omega squared is. This is v squared, okay? So what I have is k is half m v squared plus one over four m v squared. This will be three over four m v squared. Now, if the kinetic energy should be equal to potential energy, so u is m g h and should be equal to k which is 3 over 4 m v squared so m g h is 3 over 4 m v squared m and m will cancel out okay then your v is under the square root 4 over 3 gh so before it was only gh for the halo but this is 4 over 3 so it's more so um, i have to put a s here to kind of identify that for you that this is for solid body okay so s s they cancel out so The V of the solid is greater than V of a halo. So if these two objects, one is just a ring and the other one is just like a disc, have the same mass, so they have the same mass, so mass of the ring and mass of the disc are the same, are released simultaneously. The disc will reach the bottom first um, just like what we solve over here as well. We did the same type of thing. More of its gravitational potential energy becomes transitional kinetic energy and less rotational. Okay, so more, one more time. This is the exact thing that we had before. More of its gravitational potential energy becomes transitional kinetic energy and less rotational. Okay. So this guy will end up down here faster than the others, okay? So we'll have this guy getting down much faster than that one because most of its energy, potential energy, will transform to transitional uh, kinetic energy and less to rotational, okay? So let's talk about the strategy that you need to take. Uh, identify relevant concept. Use work energy relationship, conservation of energy to find a relationship involving the position and motion of the rigid body rotating around a fixed axis. Do not use energy methods if there is an elapsed time. Okay, if, if the time is given, just be careful, okay? So equation in this chapter can be used for a uh, wrapped object if a rope doesn't slip this is this is very important if it doesn't slip then you can use it use the table to find the moment of inertia so this will usually be given to you i won't ask you to find it that would be brutal to ask somebody to find the moment of inertia and then solve it because you can always look it up okay and let's take a look at this last problem and uh this at that point, then this will be the end of our uh, part three of chapter 10. Um, so uh, let's, let's solve this problem together. So what we have is a bowling ball encounters a 0.75 meters vertical rise. So what I have is kind of looking like this. I have a inclined surface, okay? And let's say that this is our bowling ball here at point one, okay? And it wants to go all the way to point two at the top. And this is 0.75 meters high. 
So in the way back to the ball rack, ignore frictional losses and assume that the ball, the mass of the ball is distributed uniformly. In other words, let's assume that the moment of inertia is two over five MR squared. See, it is given to us. You don't have to memorize it. If you go back here for a ball, two, two over five MR squared. So if you do that, and the transitional speed of the ball is 3.6 meters per second at the bottom of the rise. So in other words, they are giving this to us. They say V in point one is 3.6 meters per second. That is given to us. Find a transitional speed at the top. So at the top right there, V2, find that. V at the top, transitional speed at the top, okay? So, what we know is this. We know that all the energy at point one should be equal to all the energy at point two. They should be equal. In other words, U plus K in point one should be equal to U plus K in point two. Okay, in point one, we do not have U because we are at the bottom of this. And if you're looking at this, I can choose this to be Y equals zero. Okay, so we do not have any U, this is zero. And in other words, if you're looking at this, we have only K1 being equal to U2 plus K2. K1 is K1 of rotation plus k1 of translational speed kinetic energy u2 is m g h k2 is k2 rotation plus k2 transition okay so i'm just only going to substitute the formulas and then substitute the numbers that i have for them so k1 rotation I have half m v1 squared for, uh, this could be, this is rotation, so I have to be careful, half i omega 1 squared plus, now this is trans, translational, so I have half m v1 squared being equal to mgh plus half i omega two at the point of rotation, point two squared plus half m v two squared. Okay, and we know what the i is here. Okay, we exactly know what the i is, two over five m r squared. So something that I can do, I can multiply everything by two, so that I'll have this, this, this one over two and this one over two cancel out, then I'll have the two over here, all right? So then I have I, which is two over five, MR squared, omega one squared, plus MV one squared, being equal to two MGH, plus two over five, and this, the, they're, all the M's are the same, m r squared omega 2 squared plus m v 2 squared okay i can also cancel out m at this point so this m this m they will all cancel out because i can factor out m from right and i can factor out the same m from left and cancel them out so then what I have is this, two over five, r squared, and you know what r squared omega one squared is. So if I want to write it, I would write it like this, r omega one is v one, and r omega two is v two. We know that, we know that relationship.
So what I have is two over five, r squared omega one is squared is v one squared plus v one squared equals two gh plus two over five, r squared omega two squared, which is v two squared plus v two squared. So, now this is um, 7 over 5 v1 squared equals 2gh plus 7 over 5 v2 squared. What are we looking for? We're looking for v2. So v2 is seven over five v1 squared minus two g h now just go ahead and substitute numbers for it whatever it is so seven over five v1 squared what was the initial velocity 3.6 meters per second squared minus two 9.81 is g and h was 7.75 isn't it 0.75 meters. So I have 0.75 for G. And then whatever it is, just put it in the calculator, you will find this.